Well, good morning. morning. It is good to be back. I mean, it's always good to be here, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord and with God's people. It is always a, a special time for me. I have no idea if it's a special time for you at all, but it's a special time for me to be with you guys, and I certainly thank you for the invitation. Uh, we thank you for your love, your support, your prayers um, over the years. We, we, do, we do love and appreciate you guys immensely. Um, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke this morning, uh, Luke chapter 1. Um, you know me, after eight years. Um, we're going to be bouncing around a little bit before we get there, so if you want to keep your bookmark in Luke chapter 1. But we're going to be talking about how God breaks the silence. Uh, it's probably safe uh, to say, it's not often that you get to say that from the pulpit, that it's, it's safe that I can just make a blanket statement that would apply to all of us, but on behalf of all of us, I am very ready for 2020 to be over. Um, I actually saw a survey recently on Facebook that said more people than ever before this year are planning on staying awake until midnight on New Year's Eve. Not... <laughs> To ring in the new year, but to make sure that the old one leaves. Just ring, ring out the old. Uh, for a year that had so much promise, uh, a year ago at this time, uh, we were making all those jokes about vision and you know, tw- hindsight is 2020. If we had only known then what we know now. Uh, in fact, I'm reminded of a, a horribly irrelevant movie uh, called Hot Shots Part Two, and it's a scene um, where these two sh- soldiers are, are sitting on a, a military transport plane, and, and one of them is, is sitting down and he's reading a book, and his friend comes up to him and, and he, he asks him, Topper, what, what, what are you reading? And he said, oh, great expectations. And he said, oh, is it any good? <laughs> it's not all I hoped for. <laughs> this is it's kind of where we're at. Uh, you know, we, we had so much hope for this year of what, what was going to take place, and we had all our plans, but ultimately we know that the Lord is the one that orders the steps. You know, we can make all the plans we want, but God is the one that, that orchestrates the path that we're on. Um, and so we continue to look to Him, and we look forward to a new year and whatever God is going to accomplish through it. Maybe for the first time, uh, again, we've never lived through anything like this before, but maybe for the first time in our collective lifetimes, we can somewhat relate to the frustration and longing that Israel experienced before Christ. This wanting our world to change. Um, we're fed up with the, the current situation. We, we desperately need God to intervene to change where we're at because we can't do it on our own. Um, We sing every Christmas that carol, O come, O come, Emmanuel, echoing their longing for Christ. It says, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appears. O come, thou rod of Jesse, free thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save and give them victory o'er the grave. It's not just a political freedom and a rescue from Rome that they were longing for. Ultimately, they were longing for a spiritual freedom from the depths of hell. We need salvation. O come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight by the dawning of the light of Christ. O come, desire of nations, bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid thou our sad division cease, and be yourself our King of Peace. This is the fourth Sunday of Advent. If you're following some sort of liturgical calendar, it is the Sunday of Peace. And we look to Christ, the the Prince of Peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. I think we miss that, though, honestly, if if we're being true to ourselves, we we miss the weight of that longing. We miss the the weight of waiting, the the significance, that that longing for God's intervention. And we don't really know what it's like to be desperate for God. I think we're starting to scratch the surface a little bit. We miss out on the agony of longing for redemption. Redemption that accompanied the people of Israel right until that moment when God broke the silence in the most dramatic way possible. And we're told, even as we sang the the verse of that song, and the shepherds were terrified when the angels showed up. As is everyone in scripture, when the angel shows up, there is fear and trembling. 
We read passages like we do every Christmas, like the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah 9. We read it almost poetically. Honestly, it's a beautiful passage, and we recite it off, and it gives us those warm feelings in church. And uh, We really read it without any attachment to the emotion. We, we don't really have the concept of, of gloom or anguish or darkness, which are reasons why Isaiah 9 would have stood out to them in stark contrast to what they were experiencing as a, a promise of hope that would be clung to. They needed to cling to something, and this is something they could latch on to. Isaiah 9.1, there will be no gloom. Because there was, there was gloom, but when Christ comes, when the Messiah shows up, there's not going to be any gloom. For her who was in anguish, it's not going to be anguish anymore. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness. There was no light. There was no hope. But the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. That's the hope that they're looking for. And and they're like, well, that's kind of nebulous. Can we get more specific? And Isaiah says, yeah, absolutely. Verse 6 of Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Amen. We've uh, been going through an Advent series of readings with the kids out of the, the, the children's storybook Bible. A fantastic opportunity. It's It it skips over some stuff, obviously, because it's a picture Bible. Um, But it's so incredibly cool to be able to step back and see the larger picture of what's going on. And that each of these individual experiences and accounts in the Old Testament echo into a larger picture. Just as God is doing something specific, and, and, and we can do a disservice by being so microscopic when we look at it. We're like, this is a great story, and, and here's the application. But we miss the, the larger application that here's something incredibly cool that's going on. Uh, even when we look at the story of, uh, of the anointing of David as the king, and uh, Samuel goes to, to anoint the, the, the sons of, of, uh, of Jesse, and they're going through, and they're like... Well, these all look like kings. These should be the next one. And Well, no, there's another one. He's, he's not even here. He doesn't look like a king. He's small and runty and watching the sheep. And they're like, go get him. He's the one because God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And we love that application. I've preached that application how many times? Countless times. right? But we miss the point that the prophet was sent to Bethlehem to look for the king. And we're like, how cool is that? In that... Once again, when we come into the Christmas season, we're looking to Bethlehem to find the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in Christ. So here, Isaiah is looking forward to this child, and it's not just going to be any child. He's going to be mighty God, everlasting Father stepping into human history. We so often miss the fact that this is a people, Israel as a nation, were complacent. They were complacent in their interactions with God. They they were used to being the chosen people of God. They were the ones who had the law. They had the prophets by which God spoke. Nobody else had that. God speaking to his people. We so often miss that at the end of the Old Testament, in the end of the book of Malachi, four times in only six verses, You know, you can go home and read that like five or six times before lunch. Four times in six verses, God says, wait for it. Like, this is coming. The day is coming. Malachi 4.1, for behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you 
who fear my name. These are the people of God. And we're going to get into that a little bit this morning. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb before all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. The day is coming. The day that is coming. The day when I act and I'll send you Elijah before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And for us, it takes, what, a, a second to flip the page? You know, two if you're doing it really slow. But for them... It took 400 years to turn that page. 400 years of silence between God's word of promise that this is coming. Wait for it over and over and over again. There's a day coming. There's a day coming for those who fear my name when the son of righteousness is coming. And that sunrise is going to be glorious. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to change everything. Four times in six verses and then silence. And then there is nothing between God's promise and then his fulfillment. Did they really believe it? Did they they really trust? Were they really faithful in the time in between? Did they make use of that time that they were given to prepare, to, to really get ready? I think one of my greatest fears is of all the free time that we've had this year, have we made use of it to prepare our hearts to get ready for the Lord? When we come to the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 1, we find for them a present day living example on a much smaller and much more personal scale of what they'd already experienced on the nationalistic level. Luke chapter 1 verse 5. We read that in the days of Herod the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. That's the situation that we run into right off the bat in Luke chapter 1. But they kept praying. They kept asking the Lord to to bless them with a child. But at this point, for them it is... It is a pipe dream. It's beyond the opportunity of actually happening. A more unlikely couple to be parents, you would have a very hard time finding. Unless, of course, you looked in the Old Testament to the account of Abraham and Sarah. Because God loves to do the impossible. Or again, if you skip just a few paragraphs down in Luke chapter 1 and see another couple. Because God loves to do the impossible. Now, While Zechariah was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord. They drew straws. Zechariah, you're up. You may think it's random, but God is the one that controls it. Because it's not by accident that Zechariah shows up in the temple that day to burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. I don't know if you've ever come to the church, you know, by yourself. You have to unlock the door, turn the lights on. You're not expecting anyone. And then, boom, angel. Like, that's terrifying. Like, we're not expecting someone. And Zechariah's not expecting someone. But now there's an angel next to him. And we're told that Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. And fear fell upon him, because that's the exact response you should have when an angel shows up in front of you. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. I'm bringing you good news, man. God has heard your prayer. You and your wife, Elizabeth, will 
will have a kid. Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great before the Lord. Not just some random child. It's a very specific promise, a very specific birth, very specific individual. He will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. It sounds familiar. It sounds like something maybe they'd heard before, maybe 400 years earlier, when God said, before the day of the Lord, I'm sending you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And for a priest who knew the word of God, Zechariah should have been, that's happening through us. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. It's a very specific job description for John the Baptist. He was to get people's attention. He might have been wandering around in deep darkness, but guys, the light is coming. You need to be ready to see it. You need to be ready to turn your hearts back to God. You've been wandering away. Come back to the Lord. Repent for the forgiveness of your sins because the kingdom of God is at hand. Someone is coming. The Lord is coming. Get ready to receive him. And ultimately, he'd be the one to point out Jesus, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look to him. Follow him. Run after him. Boom. Angel. Message from God. Your prayer? Done. Answered. Finished. Zechariah doesn't believe it. Zechariah, full audacity, says to the angel, How shall I know this? Depending on the translation you're reading this morning, how will I be certain of this? How can I be sure of this? Or my personal favorite, how do you expect me to believe this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. In other words, Zechariah says to the angel Gabriel, the, the messenger of the Lord, I don't really need your help, thanks. I got a pretty good handle on what can and cannot happen. And all of the stuff you just said can't happen. It's impossible. I mean, come on, you're an angel. What do you know? I'm old. My wife's old. She's barren. We're not having kids. You've got the wrong guy. I think you've got the message mixed up for someone else. It's like he didn't grasp the significance of who he was talking to. The source of the message that the messenger was bringing or the gravity of the situation. In any way, yikes. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you, to bring you this good news. And, and you're having none of it. There's consequences. Behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Notice that Zechariah's unbelief not going to stop the plan of God. You may not believe it. There's consequences for you. It's not changing God's plan. These things are going to be fulfilled. And the people were, were waiting for Zechariah, and they're like, it doesn't take that long to burn incense. Did he get lost? Like, he's, he's still in there? What's going on? They were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he can't speak. He's unable to speak to them, and they realized he'd seen a vision in the temple, and he just kept frantically gesturing, making signs to them, and he remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, rejoicing quietly to herself. Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. We're then told that six months into Elizabeth's pregnancy, there is 
the announcement of another, even more miraculous pregnancy. Again, the angel Gabriel is sent as the messenger, this time to the town of Nazareth, to speak to the Virgin Mary. In verse 30, the angel says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And the difference between Mary's response and Zechariah's response is that Mary believes. She, she hears it, she gets it, and she responds in verse 34. Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Okay, wait, it, it sounds like she has just as much questioning doubt as Zechariah did. Like if we're just reading that sentence, how can we know Mary's level of faith? I would suggest to you that there is a a difference in the way that these two sentences sound. Just just listen to how they sound out loud. The the first two questions. How is that going to happen? In contrast to, how is that going to happen? One of those is expressing resistant, incredulous, skeptical doubt. And the other is expressing willing amazement and wonder and awe. And secondly, we only need to look at the difference in Gabriel's response to each of their questions. Verse 35, the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Do you believe that this morning? Same God. Same God who loves to do the impossible. Even when you're surrounded in darkness, God can send the light. Even when you're surrounded in silence, God can shatter that silence. Verse 39, we're told that Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. She cries out in verse 42, Blessed, Mary, are you among women? Blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Notice, guys, that the first one to recognize the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus Christ, was an unborn fetus. It's not a political statement, just fact. And Elizabeth then announces the blessing over Mary as she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. The contrast, of course, is Zechariah, who when he heard the the words spoken from the Lord, did not believe. Then we see verses 45 to 55, Mary's beautiful song of praise, the, the Magnificat. And then in verse 56, we're told that she remained there with Elizabeth and Zechariah for, for three months before returning home. Verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. This is something that was unexpected. We we knew that you couldn't have kids, and now you're having a kid. That's amazing. We're celebrating with you. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. Because that's what you did. You just that seemed to carry on the family tradition. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, Really? Like, are you sure about that? Because, like, you don't have any Johns in your family? It it seems kind of weird to go off the board here. Like, none of your family, none of your relatives are called by this name. 
And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. Now guys, I, I'd never noticed this before, but it's been suggested that not only was Zechariah for the last nine months mute, unable to talk, silent as both a punishment for his unbelief and a sign that something miraculous, something out of the ordinary was going on here. It's not normal for you just to lose your voice completely. And it coincides with the fact that your wife, who couldn't have a baby, is having a baby. Something's going on, and it's a small town, so people start to talk. Something's going on here. It's a sign that something out of the ordinary is happening. But it's also entirely possible that he was also deafened. That he was surrounded by silence. Look at verse 62. Verse 62 does not say, and they asked him what the baby should be called. Now verse 62 says, they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. Imagine nine months where you can't speak and you can't hear. You have a lot more time to think and ponder and meditate and search the scriptures to prepare your own heart. Because there would have been a time of uh, probably beating himself up pretty good. Why didn't I just believe there was an angel in the temple? That doesn't happen. I'm an idiot. I should have trusted. I should have believed. But after the first few months of that, he starts to realize there's something going on here. I need, to, I need to delve into this. I need to dig into this. And he makes use of the time, and we know he does, because of his response in just a few minutes. This is a dramatic theological echo. This is a doubling down on God speaks. God makes this promise, this miraculous promise. Wait for it. The day is coming. And then there's silence. For them, as a nation, 400 years of silence until God breaks the silence in the most dramatic way possible. Angelic messenger shows up. Zechariah, you and Elizabeth, you're going to be parents. You're going to have a son. He's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. He's going to do all these amazing things, and he's going to point to Jesus. And Zechariah doesn't believe it. It's a doubling down, a redoubling of God speaks, and then silence, and then God breaks the silence again. It's meant to get your attention. It's meant to get everyone's attention. Verse 63, And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And they're about to wonder even more. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed. And he spoke, Blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with them. I mean, we just came to celebrate. These, this couple didn't, couldn't have kids. Now they're having a kid. This is great. We're feeling good. We'll have some cake and some balloons. It was great. And now the, the dad who couldn't talk for nine months suddenly opens his mouth after naming him right off the board, the name of John, and starts praising God. That is a little bit terrifying. And it grabs their attention. And they say, something is different about this kid. What then will this child be? Now that God's got your attention, do you think that what comes next might be important? John Piper says, Zechariah had nine months of silence to brood and, and ponder and pray and meditate on his Bible. For him, it's the Old Testament. His silence may have been a divine rebuke for his unbelief, but God always turns his rebukes into rewards for those who keep the faith. Gradually, in the silence of those months when he could not converse with his wife or friends, Zechariah began to see what was happening. And it began to sink into his head and into his heart that these were stupendous, unrepeatable, incredibly significant days. And here's the application. If we don't seek silence, we will probably not feel 
the stupendous significance of God's work in history or God's work in our lives. It would be a rare thing to be gripped and moved deeply in a noisy room. There is a close correlation between stillness and a sense of the stupendous. Psalm 46.10 tells us to be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Because now when God breaks the silence for Zechariah, he is filled with the Holy Spirit and he begins to prophesy. And this incredible prophetic song begins and ends with God's declaration that I'm bringing salvation. Notice the message turns from We need to be rescued from our enemies to ultimately we need to be rescued from sin. Verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Then Zechariah turns his attention to John and he says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. And then just as quickly, Zechariah turns his focus back to God. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. This morning I want to quickly focus your attention on just three things. The first is God's promise. Notice for Zechariah, it's in the past tense. Nine months earlier, Zechariah couldn't believe his wife was going to have a kid. And now, filled with the Holy Spirit, he is so confident that God is working all of this out for his good and for his glory in sending the Messiah that he puts it all in the past tense. Verse 68, Blessed be the Lord of God, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. God has visited. God has redeemed. The contrast is, Now is, God said it, and in Zechariah's mind, it is as good as done. It's finished. God's already done it. But Jesus hasn't even been born yet. It's done. God's making it happen. God's promise. Secondly, God's presence. The coming of the Messiah was going to be, and always was going to be, the coming of God. The God of Israel has visited and redeemed. The child was to be the sunrise who would visit us from on high. We already read Isaiah 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. The government shall be on his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Matthew 1, verse 22 and 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God's promise is in the past tense. God's presence is that God was going to step down himself. And thirdly, God's people. That he was coming to redeem, ransom, rescue his people. And in one sense, Zechariah has this nationalistic picture of Israel. We want to be rescued. We want to be redeemed. Rome's boot is on us. Get us out of that. But then God has a bigger picture. 
that he's calling not just the chosen people of Israel, but that offer of salvation is being extended. God's plan is so much bigger. Verse 69, God has raised up, also past tense, a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Again, the promise was to be out of the line and lineage of Abraham. You're going to bless the world. Your descendants more numerous of the stars, more numerous than the sand on the shore. And out of that is going to come a ruler, a blessing that is going to bless the whole world. And then ultimately it gets a little more focused that it's going to be of the house and lineage of David. And now we see it point to Christ. Speaking of Jesus, of the house and lineage of David, and Zechariah, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uses this term, horn of salvation. He's not talking musical instrument, trumpets, horns. He's talking about like horns of a wild animal, a wild ox. The horn was a sign of strength and power and a means of victory. And this is the only place in the New Testament where Jesus is called a horn. It's not often that he gets it, so it kind of stands out. Verse 70 says that the coming of this horn of salvation was prophesied of old, which means we can look back and find it. And in the Old Testament, if you think about the the grand big picture scheme, what's the repeated theme of the Old Testament? It's God, and it's God that's going to fight for his people. How many times do we see, go out, do this, God's going to give you the victory. Go out, do this. You don't even have to fight. God's going to give you the victory. Over and over again, it's God stepping in, God bringing them victory. And so it should not come as a surprise that when we look back to the Old Testament, there's only two times in the whole of the Old Testament where this phrase, horn of salvation, is used. And both of them references to God. 2 Samuel 22, verse 3. And Psalm 18, verse 2. You can read one, it's like reading both, because it's actually referencing the same. They both record the same Psalm of David, and it's after, we're told in the paragraph title, God has given him victory over his enemies and victory over the hand of Saul. There is a contentious relationship there, we don't even have time to get into it. David's rejoicing. And David's words in 2 Samuel 22.3 and Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my savior. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. The horn of salvation is the Lord who David takes refuge in, his fortress. It is both defense as a shield and offense as a horn, that he is looking to the Savior. The picture that both David and Zechariah use is that God has to be the one to save us. Save us from what? Because it's not just political, it's not just military victory that we need. Luke 1 verse 74 that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve God, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. God is raising this horn of salvation to create a holy and righteous people who don't live in fear, but who trust in him. And if God is going to do this, if he's going to visit and redeem his people, And not just a small pocket in Israel, but his collective people of God, who are fearless and righteous, then God has to both conquer fear and unrighteousness. And he does both through Christ. The Apostle Paul in Romans 10 verse 4 tells us that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Not just a small pocket, but anyone who names the name of Christ. Romans 10.9 Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone 
everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Guys, that's the good news at Christmas. That's the good news that broke the silence that God kept and will always keep his promise. That he willingly stepped down into the glory of heaven to do himself what no one else could for us in giving us his presence in order to redeem and call out unto himself his people. God in his tender mercy sent the light of the world, Jesus Christ, the sunrise from on high to bring light to us even while we were still in the darkness of our sin. Lost in the valley of the shadow of death, and that light not only shines in the darkness, it blazes the darkness away. John the Baptist would be the one to go before Christ, to prepare his way by preparing the hearts of the people to receive God, to show them that they needed to have their sins forgiven, and that they could, to point them to the knowledge of salvation found in Jesus Christ alone. This Christmas, if you know him, guys, it's the same job description for us. To a world that is desperately searching, we know the answer. Because we know him. Point them to the Savior. May he continue to guide our feet in the way of peace and continue to break the silence by his word. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence at all. Lord, none of us deserve it. None of us are worthy. None of us can earn your approval apart from Christ and his finished work on the cross. God, we celebrate with the joy of the angels in proclaiming for unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Lord, may that joy radiate through your people in our homes and our families, in our communities, and to the world around us that needs to see the light of Christ at Christmas more than any other time of the year and and this year more than any other year before it. Lord, would you speak into the silence that pervades the world around us and may you shine a light into the darkness that is everywhere around us, that they would see and hear Christ. Lord, bring them to that point of trust and salvation and surrender and new life in Christ. It's in his beautiful name we pray. Amen.